so far, this is part three. The Lamb mystery, subtitled The Lamb on the Altar. To understand the mystery of the Lamb, we have to first understand the mystery of the sacrifice. There were steps and order to the sacrifices when they were lifted up to the altar. And we've touched on it in the past, but it's crucial we just begin there before we move forward in this mystery. For a sacrifice to be lifted up on the altar, it had to go through certain steps. The first step was called the hikriv. Hikriv, say it. Hikriv means literally the bringing near. The sacrifice had to be led to the altar, had to be brought near in a sacred procession to the altar by the one who offered it or by the priest who offered it. That was called the hikriv. And the next step of the sacrifice was called the samach. Try that. The samach was the sacred placing of hands on top of the head of the sacrifice. And that was done also by the offerer or the priest. And it was done to identify the offer. When you offered a sacrifice, you were identifying with that sacrifice, and that was going in your place. And so when you put your hands on the head of the sacrifice, there was a transference. The sacrifice would die for you. During the sin offering, the person would speak the sins of their life upon the head of the sacrifice. Now let's get into the mystery from where we left off. Matthew 26, verse 65. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you've now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They answered. He deserves death. Then they spat in his face and beat him with their fists. And others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, you Messiah, who is the one who hit you? What are they doing as it begins the account of Messiah's death? What are they doing? They're taking their hands and touching his head with it. Even though they are meaning harm, they are doing the samach. Before the sacrifice can be offered up, there has to be the placing of the hands of the ones offering it onto the head of the sacrifice. When did this happen? Right after the high priest pronounced this charge of sin over him, the sacrifice. When the hands would be touched, the samach, they would speak the sins, their sins, over the sacrifice and put their hands. So here the high priest gives the charge of the sin, and then after pronouncing it, they lay their hands on his head. Who struck him? The temple guard struck him, but it doesn't distinguish here. It says they struck him, the priests struck him, whether acting through the guards or doing it themselves. The priests were behind it. Who were the ones who touched the head of the sacrifice? The priests did that. So the priests themselves lay hands as they are the ones in charge. And the confession, it says in Leviticus 16, Yom Kippur, then Aaron shall lay his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it the sins of the people, the nation, their sins. And so what happens? There's a confessing of sins onto the sacrifice. Whose sins are confessed onto the sacrifice? The people who are offering the sacrifice. It's their own sins. Aaron had to first to confess his own sins. So what's happening here? Who's doing this with Messiah? The priests of Israel are doing it because they had to do it. What sin are they putting on him? Their own sin. Because that's what's done when you do this. You're pronouncing your own sin. So when they accused him of blasphemy, it was their sin. They were the ones who were committing blasphemy. They were putting themselves in the place of God, judging God. They were accusing God of blasphemy. That itself is blasphemy. It's a sin of man. It's a sin of the priest. But they were judging God as not being God and man is over God. That's blasphemy. It's their own sin that they're crucifying. But note something, the priests aren't just priests, they represent something. They represent others. They represent the people. So they represent Israel, and Israel's a nation of priests, which represents what? If Israel's a nation of priests, who do they represent? All nations. So here, the priests are literally putting their own sins on Messiah. Blasphemy. You know, their own sins are doing it. Jealousy, envy, arrogance. Hardness to God, corruption, which will cause him to go to his death. But they represent all the people, all Israel, and more. Then verse, actually verse 1 of the next chapter, Matthew 27. It says, Then when morning came and all the chief priests and elders gathered, 
conferred together against Yeshua, Jesus, to put him to death, they bound him and led him away and delivered him to Pilate, the governor. They led him away. Notice these words. You might not think it means a lot, but the sacrifice is always led away to the altar. The sacrifice is always led to the place of death. Isaiah 53 says what? Messiah, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Led. It's not just about being led to a slaughter to eat a lamb. It's a sacrifice it's talking about. This is part of the sacred hikriv, we just said. That sacred bringing near. It has a few parts here. Now it's the next part. They are now leading him away. The priests are in charge of leading the sacrifice to the altar. So the priests of Israel are now leading Messiah, the Lamb, to the altar. And who is going to oversee all this? Messiah is going to be led to the governor, Pontius Pilate. And that's going to lead, you know, one event is going to lead to the other. But the priests will always be in the background. The high priest, Caiaphas, is behind this. I mean, it's God. But the high priest in the natural is orchestrating things here. Why? Because the high priest is in charge of offering up the sacrifice. He doesn't realize what he's doing. Leaders can do things without realizing what they do. What are the high priests doing? They are leading him to the altar. That is the job of the priest. And now again, they're doing it in a fallen way. They're doing it with wrong motives. But God is sovereign. It's no accident. The priests are the ones to lead him to the altar. And they bring him before Pilate, and they accuse him. Verse 11, now Yeshua stood before the governor, and the governor questioned him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Yeshua, Jesus answered, It is as you say. While he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? And he did not answer. He didn't even, with regard to even a single charge, so the governor was quite amazed. Here, the priests are confessing. What are they doing? They're accusing him falsely. They're confessing sins over him. But since it's not his sins, whose sins? It's their sins. It's the sins of man because it's not his. It says he was brought, he was judged. You know, it says in Isaiah 53, prophesies, yet he had done nothing wrong. The priests, now he is brought before the people. On Yom Kippur, the high priest would stand before the sacrifice, the scapegoat before the people. And now the sacrifice Messiah is standing before the people. And one is taken from prison. Two men, one is guilty, one is innocent. Barabbas, the guilty one is released. Why? That's exactly what happens with a sacrifice. When a sacrifice is offered up, one goes free, and the one who goes free is the guilty one. The one who's innocent is the one who dies. That's the sacrifice. It dies for the other from guilt. You know, remember the sacrifice when the leper is cleansed, and it says that the priest will take a dove, a bird, and one bird is killed, and the blood goes into running water mixed with the water, and the other bird is baptized into the water and blood of the first bird and goes free, sprinkled, covered with the blood of the other one. Well, that's exactly what Barabbas is all about. It's a sign of what everyone who comes to Messiah is all about. Here is the sinner, the criminal, set free because of the sacrifice. There's so much rich, amazing stuff in the mysteries of the Lamb here. But just a note, you know, every time a Jewish man or a Hebrew boy was born, the firstborn, he would have to be purchased back from God. He was the firstborn. He belonged to God. So the parents would have to give a gift, would have to give silver to the priests, symbolically purchasing back that one. And so the son, the firstborn son, will always have to be purchased back to this day. I mean, to those who observe it. So what happens here now? For the first time in history, the priests take the money they have, and think about all the money that was given to them for this, and now they purchase back somebody. They purchase back Jesus. They give 30 pieces of silver to purchase him back. What's that? All the generations, the priests are receiving money and letting the son go. But now they take the money and they purchase him back. The only time the priests purchase someone. 
You know, because why? It's because ultimately it's the lamb who dies for all those firstborn people. It's called the, the act of redeeming your son, your firstborn son. It's called pidyon haben, the redemption of the son. And so here on the time of his execution, this guy named Barabbas, this criminal, goes free. What does Barabbas mean? Barabbas is from Hebrew bar Abba. It means the son of the father. Here, the son of the father was always purchased back. And now Yeshua is taken by the priest with that money that was given for the redemption. And he is the redemption for all. So Barabbas goes free. At the end of Yom Kippur, what happens is those who dealt with the sacrifice or the scapegoat, they had to wash, cleanse themselves because in a sense they were carrying, dealing with the sins. And so they had to cleanse themselves, wash in water, wash, take off their clothes, wash. Notice what happens. In the death of Messiah, Pilate, after he takes part in the death of Messiah, what does he do? He washes his hands. And notice something too. In the ordinance for Yom Kippur, it says that they will bring the goat to a man who stands ready to take that goat away with the sins of the people. Well, it was tradition that the man who stood to take the goat when they led it outside the city, it was tradition that this man was a Gentile, not Jewish. So here, what happens? The priest take the sacrifice and give it into the hands of a Gentile, Pilate, and the Romans. And then it says they wash afterwards. That's exactly what happens. And then it says in Matthew 27, the people answered and they said, his blood be upon us. Now that's been taken by anti-Semites to say, look, you see, the Jewish people are guilty. Well, yeah, they are, and we all are. Everybody's guilty. But the blood coming upon us is actually a good thing. The blood of Messiah. What happens after the blood is done? Like, like as for instance, with Yom Kippur, the blood is sprinkled. The blood is applied to life. Everyone who is saved, in a sense, is saying, his blood be upon me. In salvation, that's not a curse. It's a blessing. Why was Messiah handed over to the Romans? We said before, it's, there's, there's a tradition that the sacrifice was handed over, the scapegoat, to Gentiles or a man. But why the Romans? The Romans, of course, were the ones who could execute him. But also, there's another thing. The Romans are part of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire represents the world, represents man. So if the priests first represent Israel, the soldiers of Rome or the Roman represent all man. Who killed Messiah? The Jews. Who killed Messiah? The Gentiles. Everybody. To the Jew first and also to the Gentile. That's how his death came. That's how the gospel goes. The Roman soldiers acted as the agents of Rome. Specifically, they were the agents of Caesar. What was Caesar or the emperor called? He had a title. He was called Pontifex Maximus. What does that mean? Pontifex means priest and Maximus means high. What does it mean? His name was high priest. So you have the Jewish high priest and then you've got a Gentile high priest, the one who was behind both things. Look what happens. When he goes on to the cross, he's on the cross. It says, Matthew 27, verse 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Yeshua, Jesus, into the praetorium, gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him, put a scarlet robe on him, wove a crown of thorns on him and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him, mocked him, said, Hail, King, to, King of the Jews, Hail. They spit on him. They took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. Where did they strike him? On the head again and again. The samach. They touch the head of the sacrifice. Now it's for the sins of man. And what sin does Rome crucify him for? We said that for the, the priests it was blasphemy. What about Rome? For Rome, the sin was treason. He makes himself like Caesar. But what is that? Remember the principle. He's not guilty of anything. It's not his sin. This is the sin of Rome. Why? What is it? Treason is declaring yourself king above the true king. What is it about Rome, which is also the sin of man? It's man declaring himself king above the true king. Notice what they put on him. It says they put on a scarlet robe on him and they mock him. Scarlet, interesting. It's the color of blood. It's also the symbol of sin and guilt in the Bible. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Here is a scarlet robe on him. Also, it's red. The word in, in Hebrew for red is Edom, from which we get the word Adam. 
Adam is named after the earth, the red earth of the Middle East. So here he is wearing the color of sin, the color of Adam, of man, because he is going to die for the sins of man, the sins of Adam. On Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, two goats, one goes to the altar and death comes. The other one goes and escapes, takes the sins away. Symbol of the same thing. When they took the scapegoat away, and we know from the ancient writings what they did, they took a cloth and tied it around the horns of the scapegoat. Symbolic that it was taken away sin. Well, what color was that? Scarlet. They put scarlet on the scapegoat. What is Messiah clothed with? Scarlet because he's the scapegoat. Now they lead the sacrifice to the altar. They lead him through the streets of Jerusalem to the place of execution, part of the sacred procession of the Hikriv. There's something about it. Leading, going to the final place of his death. And he carries the wood upon him. Here is a link to Isaac coming up the mountain, the same place, coming up, carrying the wood. Abraham put the wood of the sacrifice on the shoulder of his son. So now God the Father takes the wood of the sacrifice, puts it on the shoulders of his son. As they go up to the place, same place where Isaac and Abraham were, wood is also a symbol. It was also used to burn the sacrifices. The sacrifice would be put on the altar and wood would do it. The burnt offering, Messiah, is as the burnt offering in Hebrew, the olah, means it's totally consumed. He is bound to the wood. They bind him to the wood. It says in Genesis 22, Abraham took his son, same mountain, and bound him to the wood. The lamb on the wood. There's always this link with the lamb and the wood. In Passover, what do you see? The blood of the lamb is put on the beams of wood. So now the Lamb of God is put on the beams of the cross. There's always the blood and the wood. And where is he led? He's led outside the gates of Jerusalem. Why? Because the scapegoat had to be led outside, outside the camp. A place in Hebrew, the word is Azazel or Gazar, actually. A place that means it's cut off. It's cut off with a man standing, in, again, in readiness, just like, again, the Roman soldiers are waiting. The sacrifices were actually killed at the gate or the altar, the, which is outside the veil of the temple. At Passover, the sacrifice is killed by the doorway. Here, Messiah is killed outside the gate, same thing. And they put on his head a crown of thorns. What's that about? Well, again, you go back to Mount Moriah, same place, where Abraham offered up Isaac. And what happened as he's about to lift up the knife? God said, stop, don't do this. And then they looked and they saw a, a ram was caught in the thickets in, in what? Caught in the thorns. It was caught by its head, obviously, thorns. So they put that on. But there's something else too. The first place where the thorns appear in the Bible is when man falls in sin and God says, now you are cursed. And now what will come up from the earth will be thorns. Thorns are a symbol of the curse. And so now Messiah wears a crown of thorns. Why? Because he is now the king of the curse. The entire, you know, when you have a king, when he has a crown, the weight of the kingdom comes upon the king. Well, now the weight of man's curse all falls upon the Messiah. Wearing this, the full thing. It's as if, you know, and here you think about the samach on the head again. Placing the head, that's where you identify your sins. Well, it's almost like Adam is going to Messiah and putting his sins on Messiah. The thorns are now Messiah's. It's Adam's sin. It's man's sin. But now that's the symbol on his head. It's our sin. It's our curse. It's Adam's curse. He dies. He is there as Adam would have died. He's bearing this. He is sacrificed by a sharp object, the nails and the spare. The same word for this in Hebrew, it's the same word, herev. It can mean also sword, it can mean spear, it can mean nails. There's a mountain in the wilderness that's named after this word, which is called Mount Horev, which is Mount Sinai. Messiah was killed under the law. Through the law, the law is good, but through that. And when you go to the story of the fall, and you have Adam and Eve, and they're, they're driven out of the garden... It says that God set up cherubim with a flaming sword. The word is herev. Can also be translated as spear, nail, all those things. That's the first time it's mentioned. 
The priests are still supervising this as they always supervise the sacrifice. The sacrifice begins at 9 o'clock in the morning. Why? 9 o'clock in the morning is the hour of the morning sacrifice. That's when all the sacrifice start at 9 o'clock. The first sacrifice starts and then all follow. He's on the cross, Psalm 22. He speaks, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. He says, why have you forsaken me? I am poured out. Why? The sacrifice is as forsaken and poured out on the altar. Even when he's on the cross, they keep throwing these sins at him. Blasphemer, false messiah. Why? He was numbered with the transgressors, the criminals. Still, king of the Jews is above him, which he is. And he says, no one takes my life. I lay it down freely. This true sacrifice gives himself. He's the ultimate sacrifice. Gives himself up. And then he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Even when he's crucified on the altar, he's giving forgiveness. Why? From the sacrifice comes forgiveness. The Yom Kippur sacrifice, the greatest sacrifice in the Bible, here, Messiah offered wearing scarlet, led outside the gate. In Daniel, it says, Messiah shall come to Jerusalem and be cut off, killed. It says this is going to be for the ending of sin, the making atonement, Yom Kippur, for iniquity. The sin offering in Hebrew is called the hata'ah. Try it. Hata'ah not only means the sin offering, it also means the same word for the sin. And in the Hebrew, it's all the same. The sacrifice is not separate from sin. It's not just a sin offering. It's as if it's sin itself is going to be killed. So it is written in Romans 8, God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. It says in Corinthians, God made him who knew no sin to become sin. That's the hata'ah. He becomes sin. In the likeness of sin, he's treated as sin. And the other word in Hebrew for the other sacrifice, very similar, is the guilt offering. The word is asham, try it. Asham is the word that means guilt offering, but it also means the guilt. Messiah is so identified, the sacrifice is so identified with it, he actually becomes guilt itself. He becomes sin itself, and then he's killed. And the amazing thing, when you read Isaiah 53, as we've been doing one of our studies on Friday, awesome thing, it says that, God made him an, an asham in Hebrew. Made him a sin sacrifice or a guilt offering. The guilt offering. And so here it is that the, the sacrifice that dies is dying for the guilt of those who offer it. And so it's interesting because the first guilt, the fall of man, happens in the Garden of Eden. And it happens by a tree. Man falls through a tree. So now it's almost like the guilt is now being displayed again. Here's a naked man as you had with Adam. And here is the tree as you had with Adam. But the only thing is man fell by a living tree. Now man is redeemed through a dead tree. The tree is now dead. Messiah is dead. But it is the redemption of the guilt that was the asham, the image of Eden. And then another part of the sacrifice God is awesome, isn't he? God is deep, isn't he? Amazing, isn't he? Messiah is all the offerings, and that is the offering that has to be poured out. And so Messiah here on the cross, his life is poured. It says in Isaiah 53, he poured himself out. He says on there, I thirst. He's poured out. And then there's that Ola offering, the, the, burnt, the whole offering that is to go up completely. He's consumed completely in, in the judgment of God. He takes upon all judgment and hell for our sins for eternity, all in that. And then he says, into your hands I commit my spirit. The sacrifice always ultimately goes up to God. And then when does he die? He dies at the hour of 3 o'clock. Is that significant? Yes, it is. 3 o'clock is the exact hour of the evening sacrifice. It's the closing sacrifice. So think about that. He's there for six hours. Six, the number of man created on the sixth day. For the number of man, he dies for the sins of man. He dies from morning to evening. His death, his sacrifice begins with the morning sacrifice, which is the first sacrifice, and ends with the evening sacrifice, which is the last sacrifice. He is the beginning and the end of everything. 
He is the beginning sacrifice and the final sacrifice. The Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the earth. The beginning and the evening, the ending. The aim is to end the old. So from morning to evening, the Alpha and the Omega. Beginning while the sun is rising, as he is the sunrise. And ending with the sun beginning to set, he is the sunset. The light of the world. Three hours of rising, three hours of falling. And something else. The morning sacrifice was always a lamb. There could have been many things, but it was a lamb. The evening sacrifice was always a lamb. So what it's saying is that you could have other things come, and you could have goats and heifers, but it always began and ended with a lamb. It all epitomized by the lamb. Just like the first sacrifice, really, the, the Passover lamb. The lamb is the beginning and the end. And it ends on Passover. The lamb was before there were any of the other sacrifices. It all began with the lamb, all ends with the lamb, where the final lamb comes in. He is the lamb. He comes on the day of the lamb, dies at the hour of the lamb, and he brings it all to finish in him. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who began existence and the one who takes the old existence to himself and ends it. Not a bone is broken, it says in John, because the Passover lamb could not have a bone broken. It says the Passover lamb and the ordinance of the Passover lamb, it says he shall be in Hebrew, tamim. Try it, tamim. Tamim means, you could say perfect. It means without blemish, without spot. But it also can mean all consumed, completed, consumed, finished. He is the consumed lamb as well. It says in the Passover ordinance, it says they will take a lamb, spotless, and they shall slay it. Now, interesting. The command doesn't say they shall slay them, because there's thousands of lambs. It says they shall slay him. Amazing. It's like saying there's one lamb for all. The priests slay the lamb on one hand. The priestly nation, Israel, slays the lamb. Rome slays the lamb. But there's one that dies for all. He is cut off. He dies outside the gates where the sacrifice is killed and where the sacrifice would be taken outside the camp at the end. Outside the holy place. It's a kind of symbolic because he's going to die. He is the holy one. He is from the holy place. He's from heaven, but he's dying on earth as if he's outside already. On Yom Kippur or the time of the sacrifice, you'll see the sacrifice is killed on the altar outside. You could see that outside. But where the real work happens is when the blood goes into the Holy of Holies, that's where it's really done. So the same thing with Messiah. He dies on the cross on earth where everybody can see it. But the real work is done in, heaven, in the heavenlies, in the Holy of Holies, as he entered the heavenly places. In the book of Hebrews, it says his body was broken. Basically, his, his, he calls it a veil. The moment he dies, it says the veil in the Holy of Holies splits apart. Splits apart. Daniel says about Messiah coming, and says, this is appointed to finish the transgression. Interesting, because it could say to finish many transgressions. Yeah, that's true. But it says finish the transgression, which almost as if it's one transgression from Eden, and it encompasses every other transgression. Well, interesting, because on the day of the fall of man, God sent the man and woman outside the gates of Eden. It says he stationed cherubim angelic beings at the place there with a flaming sword to not let anything come back. The word for in Genesis when it says he stationed them, the word is shakan. Try it. From that word shakan, you put an M in front of it, you get mishkan. Mishkan is the word for the tabernacle. And that became the temple. See, the tabernacle and the temple, it's linked back to Eden. In the temple, what do you have? You have the cherubim on every veil. The cherubim are stationed in the temple on every veil. All those veils representing you can't get through this. Man and God are separated. That all comes from Eden. The cherubim are on guard. In fact, it even says that the cherubim, he drove man to the east of Eden, so they're facing east. On the temple, the cherubim, which are engraved or woven into the veil, they always faced east. Same thing. They stand guard not to let man back, not to let sin back in. But now Messiah is going to enter back in. In order to go back in, he's got to pass through the cherubim in the spiritual realm. And the cherubim have a sword, a flaming sword. That symbolizes judgment. The word is herev, same word. He can go through, but he's going to go through by death. 
And by that, he's going to open it up. On Yom Kippur, the high priest would go through the veil, and every time he looked at that veil, he'd see the cherubim of Eden. He'd see the cherubim there. And he would go there. You know, he could go around it. He couldn't break the thing open. Messiah told the thief on the cross, he said, Today I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. Paradise? Strange. It comes from a Middle Eastern word, fardes, which means a garden. Like a garden of trees, like as in Eden. Today man was blocked out of paradise on the cross. Messiah says, today you will be with me in paradise. In the presence of God, the holy of holies. That's what it was all about. It was about coming back to God. God was saying, I'm not finished. I'm going to make a way. It's going to be a big price here. But I'm going to make a way that you can come back into paradise. And now at the very moment of his death, the Bible says the veil that had the cherubim was torn in two. What's happening? It's not just the veil, it's the cherubim. They're being pushed to the side. Open up the blood of Messiah so powerful it opens it up. You see, to bring this home and look how much is here. God, my God, it's amazing. You see, all of us grow up, what does that have to do with you, in a world of separation. Children of Adam, cast out, veiled, obstacled, barriered, longing but unable to get back. We have barriers of fear, we have barriers of rejection, barriers of hurt, barriers of failure, of sorrow, of guilt, of shame, veils that hang over our lives. And they all come ultimately from that first one from Adam, the barriers between man and God. But from that moment he died, the curse is truly broken. The veil is torn in two from top to bottom by the hand of God. To the right and to the left, the cherubim are pushed aside, who guarded the gates of Eden and the way to the tree of life. Meaning the barrier of all, bar the mother of all barriers is swept away, and that means all the other barriers are swept away in the blood of Messiah. Why did the cherubim, even the cherubim angelic being, why did even that thing have to be, why did God take his own vessel, his own veil, its beautiful, gigantic, holy vessel, and tear it apart. Why? Because Messiah was passing through. It was the ultimate, ultimate Yom Kippur. The veil is finished because of the blood of the Lamb. 